Hello, good morning and welcome to Amsterdam here in the Netherlands, home of Guerrilla Games, Sony's first party studio responsible for the Killzone franchise and one of 2017's most wonderful surprises, Horizon Zero Dawn. Guerrilla are based in the heart of Amsterdam, a city they've called home for 17 years now. But until quite recently, the studio was only ever associated with a single franchise, a series of sci-fi first-person shooters exclusive to Sony consoles. But after years of developing battles between the ISA and Hellgast, Guerrilla embarked on a new challenge, to create a game several times the scale of Killzone, an open-world game, set in a new type of post-apocalypse a game with a meaningful story, memorable characters, and a lush, naturalistic world. We know how this story ends. Horizon Zero Dawn has been a massive success for Guerrilla, critically praised and commercially successful. But as I completed the game earlier this year, I couldn't help but think, how? How did they get here? How did they pull it off? How does a studio that cut their teeth making linear first-person shooters scale up and retool to make an open-world role-playing game? What were the many challenges they faced in doing so? And what were the creative decisions that led them to create the universe and gameplay of Horizon Zero Dawn? We have a lot of questions. I better finish this coffee soon. Our story starts in the year 2000. Guerrilla Games was created from the amalgamation of three Dutch companies, Digital Infinity, Lost Boys and Orange Games. At the time the studio was only about 30 people strong and many of those people are leads at the studio today. Back then Lost Boys had been working on a first person shooter concept known simply as Marines. But during this era of games development, self publishing wasn't so accessible to small studios. So the first thing Guerrilla needed was somebody to help them make it. They noticed that for all of the success that Sony was enjoying in the console market, they didn't have a strong first person shooter in their exclusive portfolio unlike, say, Microsoft, who were selling consoles based on the word of mouth around Halo. So they pitched Marines to Sony and got themselves the deal of a lifetime. Signing a deal with Sony was, uh, that was the, the ultimate, uh, that was the ideal for an independent developer. I think Sony had 70-72% market share in that PlayStation 2 era. Uh, so for us, as a, as a tiny, tiny studio in the Netherlands where there was no games industry, to sign an, uh, a, a deal with, with PlayStation to get your title published by, by Sony, that was, uh, that was exactly what, what everybody wanted at the time. And then our relationship evolved very gradually. Uh, so we did one of our many games and we focused on, <coughs> on Killzone, on Marines that became Killzone. Uh, we decided to, uh, to basically put all of our eggs in one basket and do one thing very well and, and not be distracted by other genres and other things. Um, and then that project became increasingly important to PlayStation and they wanted to make it bigger because originally, and, and not very many people know that, Killzone was set out to be a budget title. All right. uh, it was had a very small budget, had a very narrow scope. Um, and because it, you know, it, it, it was interesting, it looked good, uh, particularly graphically, it was very very strong in, in the eyes of, uh, of our producers at PlayStation. And now we're talking 2002, 2003. Um, it became a full-fledged AAA game. After four years in development, the studio's first game was released. Killzone had a mixed reception from the game-playing public. Many critics noted that it contained the seeds of a great game, but technical issues in graphics, gameplay and sound design made it hard to enjoy it. In truth, the game had barely come together in time, and its multiplayer mode had been crammed in last minute. It was pretty ambitious and had fallen short of both the market and Gorilla's expectations. But that didn't stop the Gorillas from setting even loftier ambitions. The team learned from the mistakes of the first game by employing dedicated game designers and installing game directors to help keep the new project on track. Executive producer Anji Smets remembers that time well. Once so we shipped Killzone 1 and, and we knew that we had a lot to uh, improve just on our development process. For a while we worked on an internal vision video about what a uh, first person shooter game could look like uh, 
on for the next generation and it was meant for internal use only to be like you know a visionary piece because when we started it was uh, going to be a, a Killzone, yeah, Killzone 2 was originally a PlayStation 2 game. If this visionary piece is starting to sound familiar it's because you've probably watched it. What was meant to be a target video for the team to aim towards somehow made it onto Sony's stage at E3 2005. When we were in the planning stages for this event we asked many of our development partners including several teams within our own internal studios to submit content to be shown today. We expected to see a few bright lights and a couple of diamonds in the rough, as it is early in the development process. Our partners have prepared a glimpse into this future to share with you today, so let's take a look at what fans have to look forward to. Near the end of the press conference, Kaz Hirai introduced a demo reel of existing franchises that would see games on the upcoming PlayStation 3. And it was there, right after what we now know was the first tease of Red Dead Redemption, that we caught our first glimpse of the second Killzone. Which we thought was very cool. You know, we worked really hard on this visionary piece, uh, our vision for the future of, uh, of gaming. Um, and then somebody from, I believe it was the marketing group in the States said, yeah, and this is running real time on the PlayStation 3. And we were watching this back home going like, no, what, what does he just say? Because, you know, it's, that's not true. And, but then we figured like, yeah, you know, nobody will believe that because it's obvious that it's all, uh, all rendered. Um, and then we went online and uh, lots of people actually did believe it. And then we were like, oh, this is, this is not good. Because in reality, we, I think we just, I think the first kit had just arrived for R&D purposes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we had the first triangle rendering then already, or maybe that even took like two more months before we were up to that point. Mm. But the, the sheer enthusiasm that, that came out of us showing the trailer did, I think, uh, play a big role in us then being asked to make it a PlayStation 3 title. Right. And that's also when we realized we really had to scale up the team, because the, the PlayStation 3 compared to the PlayStation 2 was so much more powerful, we could show so much more detail. What Killzone 1 was, it, it, it did well, it, it gave us a reputation for technology, for art, uh, but then in terms of gameplay, um, that, that very visceral combat experience, uh, that was Killzone 2. Killzone 2 was a huge success for the studio and cemented Guerrilla as one of Sony's most important first party studios. Over the next few years the team would continue to work on the franchise, utilizing whatever new technology Sony had come up with. Killzone Liberation was a flagship title for Sony's first handheld, the PSP. Killzone 3 came out for the PlayStation 3 in 2011, supporting both PlayStation Move and 3D technology. And Killzone Mercenary was released for the PlayStation Vita in 2013. But after a decade of working on dark, dystopian futures, the team recognized that they couldn't do Space Nazis forever. If people work on something for too long, uh, there is this notion of fatigue, uh, creative fatigue, and they, they can no longer do their best work. Doesn't mean that we'll never do anything in the Killzone series, because we really love that franchise, we love the universe that we created, but it's just healthy for people to do something else. So we were already, I guess, back in the Killzone 3 days, uh, when we, that was our fifth um, Killzone game. We were open to exploring something new. So we're, it's 2010, around March or April. Uh, we've got about nine months left on Killzone 3. And so we were thinking like, okay, well, this is the third one. Are we going to continue with this? Uh, it was, of course, this question is like, Killzone was successful, but never sort of, you know, big successful. Right. Is this really what we want to be doing for another 10 years? Is this the best way that we can spend all the time and effort and talent of the team? Then there was, uh, I guess, also the idea that people were uh, interested in something else. Uh, there was a, a craving for, I guess, a, a a very positive, very colorful kind of, you know, the color palette, but also the tone of voice. Whereas Killzone always was very gritty. We always wanted to uh, to make a world that, you know, very dystopian. You want to get the hell out of it. We really wanted to make a game that you want to spend time in. That's that's beautiful. That's comfortable. So uh, maybe that has to do with people, you know, having kids in school, and it's nice to talk about it um, at the schoolyard. Uh, but that there certainly was that hunger for something very positive and colorful and meaningful. I was working on it from like let's say '99, so it was quite quite some time. I think for the whole studio, everybody was sort of ready for for something new, something fresh. Although I think we were quite afraid of it at the same time, but yeah, we, we definitely were all looking for something new. I think that's what we got. <laughs> <laughs>
When the studio was planning what their future identity was going to be, the games they were going to make in the next 5-10 years, they did so in a typically Dutch egalitarian manner by inviting the guerrillas to pitch their own ideas. Back in 2010, so that was at the, towards the end of the Killzone 3 development track, we uh, put together a brief, a uh, very detailed, probably an eight, nine page brief discussing everything, you know, from you know, commercial rationales to uh, guerrilla's core competences. We had a lot of constraints and conditions that, uh, that we wanted uh, the pitches to adhere to. Everybody that worked at Guerrilla was invited to pitch. We're a pretty flat uh, company. Right. It's also very Dutch, not to be too uh, hierarchy uh, focused. Mm. So we we, yeah, we see everybody uh, as, as equal equality is a, a really important value also in Dutch society. Um, I believe we got almost 40 pitches back. Uh, really interesting to me is that there, I believe there was only one straight shooter that came back. Right. I mean there was there was gun gameplay in many of them, uh, but in, in a, a, a straight solid FPS uh, that was only one, maybe two of them. And then that tells you something about the studio? That tells you, and I think that, that illustrates that, that hunger, that craving for something new. I might have said no puzzle games, no racing games, because other people are way better at that than we are. So don't do that. Um, but within that, everything was possible. We also went over Sony's portfolio at the time. Sony had no Western RPG in their exclusive portfolio. And you saw a lot of people actually taking that on board. Because I think when you, as a development studio, the part of Worldwide Studios, you get that creative freedom. You have also, at the same time, a huge responsibility to contribute. Uh, and so the whole studio got invited to do pitches. Uh, we got, I think, about 30, 40 quite a bunch, uh, it took us weeks to review them all. Right. Uh, so everybody had to do a stand-up presentation of about 20-30 minutes uh, in front of uh, the group of directors and managers of the company. The studio was awash with ideas, some were full-blown game concepts, others were just ideas for mechanics. There were several role-playing games, some were set on fantastical worlds, others in alternative pasts, some in the far-flung future. One of them had a robot companion. Gorilla were a little cagey about telling us about these pitches. It's a creative well that they still pull from today. But they did tell us about the two most important ones. The first came from JB, the studio's art director. It was an open world game featuring a young girl. A girl who was fascinated with her world's lost past. A lot of the elements were already there. Uh, it had the machines, it had a post-apocalyptic world that was completely overgrown, a thousand years after the fall of mankind. Uh, Aloy was already there, the Trifor was already there. Uh, what we didn't have yet basically was a completely cohesive story about what happened to the world. That was sort of cheating during the, during the pitch because I said like, it's a mystery. <laughs> um, it was also by far the most risky one. Right. Uh, because sort of even from a point of design philosophy and production, uh, it's sort of like a 180 compared with, to what we did before. Uh, it wasn't clear what the gameplay would be in that game. So that, that was hard for me to see. Um, yeah, that, I knew that was going to be a lot of work to figure that out. But it had such cool um, uh, elements in it, like the machines and the far future, the sci-fi setting, sense of danger in it. There were so many nice things in there. And it being an open world um, action RPG, and that was also part of the pitch. That to me personally also had huge, huge appeal. The studio loved the pitch, but there was a snag. At around the time they were talking about Horizon, a similar looking game was announced just across the North Sea in England, a post-apocalyptic reimagining of the Ming Dynasty novel Journey to the West. There must have been thousands of people living here. More. Tens of thousands? Maybe. At the same time, basically, Ninja Fury was working on a call, game called Enslaved. Right. Um, and Enslaved basically featured a post-apocalyptic world, uh, a female protagonist, uh, machines that were slumbering that would be awakened. Um, so I myself went to Herman and said, like, I don't think we should do this. It touches too much of these other points. Uh, and Herman Beggy sort of was very reluctant. He said like, okay, well, I think it's a bad idea to do this, but you know, we'll can it for now and maybe we'll look at it later. And so the company went to work on another project, uh, which also people felt basically was a little bit more safe and secure. It was more in our line. Uh, it was a gritty sci-fi universe, but still very imaginative. 
Gorilla put Horizon to the side and started working on another game. In terms of gameplay, it was something a lot closer to the work they had done with Killzone, but less linear, more open, and totally different in terms of setting. A sort of alternate universe monster mashup with a striking visual style. Yeah, that was uh, that was Roy uh, Postmas pitch. Uh, yeah, that was a, a game very steampunky. That that was his thing. Yeah, it was like uh, alternate history in the um, uh, industrial revolution, and he would throw together all like the historical figures, uh, figures from from the time. So you get like the Jekyll and Hyde's and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It's a bit like uh, was it League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's sort of that angle. Uh, gunplay in there, uh, but if you if you look at uh, at the concept art that he produced for that, uh, it was very very reminiscent of the order, and we weren't aware of that project at the time. Right. So when that was internally shown, uh, that was wait, I, I thought we were doing that or we were not doing that. How great that they were doing it. The studio worked on the unannounced game for over six months, but when it came time to pitch it to Sony, they couldn't get Horizon out of their minds. I think it was some point when we were already pitching the other one that, that I went to Herman and said like, you know, why exactly do we shelve Horizon? Because there were some market conditions, other games that came out. And I was like, we should try again. Um, and Herman was actually, actually on the same page. He was thinking the same thing around that time. We actually went quite extreme with this, uh, this idea of openness and, and uh, getting uh, and inviting people's opinions. Like many publishers do, uh, Sony, World Watch Studios gather after E3 when everybody is in LA. Uh, we had this meeting of about 150 devs and, and senior execs as well. Right to the point, Beggy, where we were going to pitch it to Sony, Herman Ludley came at, at sort of like the 11th hour and said like, get the other pitch as well, get Horizon and we'll do it both at the same time and we so like well that's unfair Biggie here's a highly polished pitch with lots of you know interesting animations and game mechanics that already work and this is sort of like a really rough sketch. I pitched both of them and I literally just asked people raise your hand and it wasn't so much by vote but I um, I went to see the people that have very, had very strong opinions and what I really picked up on was the people that that loved Horizon, they loved it with a passion. They really liked so many things about it, including the character, the story, that, that crazy world of that, that, that nature and then the machines in it. Uh, so the, the quality of the likes that we got were really, really strong and we built on that. The Gorillas decided to take the risk and follow their passion. Their next franchise would be set in the world of Horizon. But there were dozens of things that could go wrong. First, Gorilla had never made an open world game before. They didn't have that expertise. Plus, this was coming out on a whole new generation of console. There were too many unknowables and too many things that could negatively impact the project. So Anji and the leadership team devised a plan to mitigate that risk. They'd work on two games. The first, a launch title for the PlayStation 4 in the Killzone franchise. This would help the team build the necessary tools and jump over many of the tech technical hurdles of working on a new platform. When we were making Shadowfall, we already were making Horizon in parallel. So some of the things in um, Shadowfall were like test beds for Horizon as well. We were like stretching up our coordinate space because we knew we had to do an open world. So we, everything had to be wider and larger and we're starting to do those experiments. So some of the code in Shadowfall actually dealt with like large open worlds, but like was not actually used. But um, into very late in the day, um, we couldn't really afford to have two different engines. So it's exactly the same engine. What we did at some point is like the, the code to run Horizon and Shadowfall was pretty much exactly the same code until the day that Shadowfall shipped. Like you just put different content there, like a different mod pack basically, and it became Horizon. But while most of the studio was working on Shadowfall, a smaller team would focus on Horizon in what they called an ideation process. This is effectively a long iterative brainstorming process where the team would try out new ideas, build prototypes and iterate on the game in a small skunkworks project. Horizon could have ended up looking like a completely different game, but the decisions made during this ideation process would steer it towards the game it would eventually become. How it works over here is that we don't have a, a sort of like single creative director. 
uh, controls everything. A, a group of three people, game director, the art director and, the, and the, the narrative director, that together sort of create the creative board. One of the things maybe that we established quite early on uh, is this design process, and it sounds a little bit pretentious, but it's called intrinsic ideation. And it's quite a word, a mouthful. Uh, but the whole idea is basically is that uh, within this sort of design philosophy, you can't just do something because it's cool. Uh, it's a way of avoiding what people call the rule of cool. Like if you have an idea and you just add another cool idea on top of it, another cool idea, then basically the idea must be cooler. But then you end up with, you know, uh, dinosaurs riding sharks with lasers. Uh, so the idea was really basically like everything has to come from things that we have already established as truth to the world. So with Horizon, when we started, we created small experiences, small playable experiences uh, that allowed us to kind of create these moments, these encounters with machines through a bit of nature with a female character and everything didn't look like it looks today when the game shipped but um, at least you could see the potential and you could get a feel for it and by playing this over and over and by adjusting things you also get, you learn quite a lot. You learn about the density, you learn about the pacing, you learn about positioning, landscaping, many, many things uh, you can learn from just playing your own prototypes. And that's, that's an approach that I personally really like. Uh, rather than having a brainstorm at the start and then do implementation, it's a process where you implement and you analyze, you evaluate, you have some conclusions that you then brainstorm about and then you implement those again, you evaluate, you have some conclusions and you go through this cycle. And with those cycle you try to bring something to a, uh, a better standard. And to give you an example, the, the robots, the machines. So we started designing those uh, with a bit of a kill zone mindset. Okay. In kill zone we always had some uh, like flying, uh, or like more like war machines. If you look back at the designs, they, they have this sort of military style uh, and we, we played around with the idea that they could be sort of um, like these maybe broken war machines. I, I think the, the bigger problem with it was that it didn't work uh, from an emotional perspective, like the, the emotional core was just completely off. We, we came from Killzone, uh, basically all our designs for military, industrial machines. Uh, and that's sort of also the sort of the first avenue that we took. Uh, and we built a whole bunch of these things, sort of like alien, creepy machines, quite inhuman, uh, quite monsteresque, grotesque even to certain points. Uh, and then we put it in game and it didn't really work. The whole idea was basically that you felt like a hunter and the moment basically that you put, your, put a player against something that looks like you know, a tank from Terminator, you start feeling more like a soldier in a war. And what the team did then is they, they went back to a period in time where uh, humans were not the dominant uh, life form, the Stone Ages. Uh, and then I don't remember who, but somebody suggested, like, yeah, maybe we should make like a dinosaur uh, machine. And then uh, lots of people got really worried. They were like, robot dinosaurs, you know? That's, are you crazy? Absurd. That's, nah, that's never gonna work. Uh, but at the same time, we, we, yeah, we were sort of stuck. And I think this is great when you have an ideation, you just you can try things out, right? It's all right. about keeping it uh, moving. Then you see the very early concept art that was created. That already shows you like, hey, you know, this, this side kind of works. Uh, we had some really rough models in 3D and yeah, yeah, it kept working. So even though um, you could say that intellectually, uh, intellectually it, it didn't make any uh, sense, right. like from an intellectual perspective, it doesn't make any sense. But emotionally, this completely started to click. Set the concept art team to paint out Beggy what this could look like, and then suddenly Beggy we got these pictures of, you know, sort of primitive man, Beggy hunting large robot brachiosaurs, and Beggy everybody looking like it. It's like, this looks awesome. Like, you know, I know it's silly, but I want to play this. Uh, so like, well, <laughs> I guess we're making a robot dinosaur hunting game. Uh, <laughs> You felt much more like a hunter because you could study them and read them and get a mental picture of this thing instead of if it was really alien and strange, it would be really hard to develop that image. Players of games see everything in reverse. We see the final product yeah. and then we dive backwards. Yeah. But it's obviously like you've got this wide cone and you're trying to get everyone basically to the same like creative mm. point. Yeah. Is that like is that a struggle? Like trying to it make is. your art department and grab Absolutely. everything? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the way I always see that is that you're kind of like um, in a, some sort of a sinus wave, you're going left and right in this cone 
but you're trying to slowly go to that end point where everything comes together. But it's, on one hand, it's good that you go left and right and go quite wide, that you explore different options. So in the beginning, I, th I think that's, yeah, it's only, uh, only for the better to explore lots of options and ideas and just to see if something works and sticks or not. But at some point you have to narrow down and cut the things that really don't fit. Over the course of this process, the design team was beginning to find its form. The team started to understand how large the world needed to be. It turns out 50 times smaller than what they had originally envisaged. They wanted a denser world, packed with flora and fauna. But this had its own consequences. You may have already noticed the second player in this footage we showed earlier. Yes, Horizon was originally going to have co-op. But to do this, they'd have to drop the level of detail in the game by half. Through ideation, they knew that that wasn't the game they were trying to make. As the project picked up speed, the team realized that they were lacking in two departments, two areas that they had never had to dedicate much time to in the past, narrative and quest design. It's fair to say that narrative took a backseat to gameplay in Guerrilla's earlier work. The stories in Killzone were done by contractors, so they never had an internal writing team. On top of that, linear first-person shooters don't really require a quest department. So to fill in the gaps, Guerrilla would target two key hires, a narrative director and a quest director. So th there are really two things. One is we acknowledge that there's a lot in Horizon that truly builds in our core competence and uh, what we're good at that needed to be shown in Horizon. So the combat, we're making an open world action RPG, we wanted to make sure that the, the core combat was better than the competition. That was a goal because uh, you know, that's, that's what we knew how to do. And then there were elements that we had zero to hardly any experience with, quest design, uh, storytelling in an open world setting, uh, so that was a recruitment process. Uh, we went after some uh, some hand-picked uh, key hires uh, on the writing team, on the quest design team, uh, but also we understood that we required a real um, overhaul of the technology to be able to make that, so the, the tool chain that you need to build these quests, to facilitate great looking graphics in an open world uh, to the expectations that people have of a guerrilla title that typically was more linear and therefore easier to build. Uh, so we had very well-defined project goals and then we went after the right people um, to supplement the talent that we already had. I joined the studio about four years ago. Uh, I was brought on board specifically for this project. Uh, Gorilla reached out to me uh, because of my background in open world role-playing game development. Um, and when they did that, they, they kind of showed me the pitch for the project. Uh, and I, I was pretty stunned. Uh, I mean, first of all, uh, I was uh, kind of flabbergasted to see that a studio that had been working on linear first-person shooters had decided to create this huge open-world action role-playing game. And you're no stranger to post-apocalyptic uh, open-world role-playing games. Right, yeah. So I was, I was lead writer on Fallout New Vegas. Um, and, but, uh, you know, this world, of course, was something completely different. Whereas uh, the entire Fallout series is the uh, post-apocalypse is this kind of junk heap that's left behind uh, uh, as a result of all this human savagery. This was something that was striking these notes of grace and beauty and majesty, uh, what we often call post-post-apocalyptic uh, uh, nature, uh, that took a lot of inspiration from BBC uh, you know, BBC documentaries. With some of the early footage that they were showing me uh, from prototypes, you could immediately imagine David Attenborough just starting to narrate uh, what was on screen. Uh, and so it, it felt like it was something that was a, a very distinctive, uh, uh, unlike anything I'd worked on before. When John came on board, the story and the game were quite different. The story still revolved around Aloy, it had the world, the idea of the machines, her as a hunter, but it centered around a towering city in the center of the game's world. Back then it was known as Mesa City. It still exists in Horizon Zero Dawn, but at around a quarter of the size, and you don't reach it until much later in the game. Maybe you remember it. It's the game's largest city, Meridian. But of course it wasn't just large things that were cut by the writing team. Lots of smaller things did too, including horses. I remember uh, <laughs> when, when John came in, 
he, he did a complete overhaul of the story mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very happy he did. Um, and one of the things in, uh, that he, he needed for the story was that the world did not have large animals anymore. Right. So for the first couple of years we have uh, all the prototypes, you see Aloy riding on a horse. And then sort of John comes in, overhauls the story and says all horses are out. <laughs> so naturally the, the other creatives who were like, what do you say, like they were completely used to Aloy riding on a horse. It's ridiculous, she has a horse, like, you know, look at all the cool stuff, look at it, like all the, the prototypes that we have. And, and, and John said, no, this is really important. Like, you know, I want Aloy to be special in this world, so she gets the focus device and she can hack machines, so therefore she's the only person. Because, you know, if, if she can ride a horse, everybody can ride a horse in this world, right? So, looking back at it, it made a, a huge amount of sense what John was saying, but it was not necessarily clear when, when that point was brought to the table, and of course there was lots of resistance. Yeah, he made, imme he made immediately such a big impact uh, on yeah, just taking invent inventory of what, what we already came up with. A lot of it he threw out of the window and he basically wrote a new story. Um, and we went through a no number of iterations on that story as well to really fine tune it. And uh, I think that took about half a year to get the story from when he joined to when we thought, okay, this story, we, we like the story, this is what we're going to make. I think it's actually that uh, what's so different about it is that in the case of, of something like uh, a Fallout game, um, you're essentially stepping into a player-shaped hole. You get to create any kind of character that you want to be. This was actually one of the huge challenges on Fallout New Vegas. We literally had to account for the possibility that the player was a sociopathic walking flamethrower right. who would immediately murder anyone that they encountered or someone who was like Mahatma Gandhi in the wasteland, you know, <laughs> someone who literally would not even harm, uh, you know, a, a cazador, right. right? And and both of those playthroughs had to be possible. But the relationship that you have to the world when you're playing that type of game uh, is very different, right? I mean, you're sort of, you know, figuring out what are all the different levers of power and what you want to do with the various factions, and you're uh, uncovering a lot of lore uh, that can be really cool, but is basically impersonal to you. It's about the world. You know, the world itself poses kind of a big mystery, um, but it's not your story as the player necessarily. Whereas in this game, um, everything about the ancient world, especially everything that you're going to find on the main quest, that's directly relevant to Aloy's own story. She's you know, trying to solve the riddle of her birth. Uh, we were trying to create a hybrid between what's uh, most uh, exciting about playing a massive open world role playing game in terms of the scope of the world and also the depth of the lore and a lot of the pleasures of interactive dialogue and of some choice but we were really trying to blend that with what's most uh, exciting and cool about an action adventure uh, that has a uh, an authored uh, character that has uh, you know a, a defined arc uh, and, and the cinematic storytelling that's used to uh, to convey that. Story in video games is action, and so for a story to work, you need actions that help the player feel connected to it. John was hired to write the story, develop the lore, and create the characters, but the actions those characters must take was the work of another department, quest design. This is where Guerrilla targeted another key hire, another American too, David Ford, who, like John, has quite the resume. Uh, I originally started working on EverQuest for Sony Online Entertainment. Uh, I did that for about three years, and then I worked on DC Universe Online in Austin, Texas. Uh, next up, I worked at Zenimax Online, working on the Elder Scrolls MMO that was right. recently released. And then I continued my eastward journey and landed here in Amsterdam. <laughs> so, Moscow next. <laughs> <laughs> or Singapore, who knows. Right. The intro is actually really, really interesting because it went through a lot of changes compared to where we were in that initial document. Um, for a long time, Ayla was not going to get the focus until the proving. Um, and she was going to take, in, in the, the proving now, you, you take a focus off of uh, the Eclipse leader that's, that's dead on the ground. Um, but we realized that we were going to be tying so much into the focus in terms of UI and gameplay elements um, that it would be very difficult for us to have the first several chapters of the game 
without that. So um, the part of the beginning where you actually fall into the old world ruin and you find the focus in there, that was actually a later addition. Right. Because we went back to the writing team and we said, guys, we have to have a way to get the focus into her hands earlier. I, I know that in some of the early versions of the story, I had her discovering this focus device uh, when she was an adult. And there was a lot of pushback from design saying like, Look, uh, that's basically saying that you want to not have our user interface, um, you know, until like hour three or something like that. Are you insane? And I really resisted it. And it's just one of these examples of how wrong I can be, you know, right. um, the, really the importance of collaboration, you know, uh, across the disciplines. They really pushed really hard to say, like, this needs to be something that she's getting at the beginning of the game. It was just the right choice. It's also something that, you know, what I love about that, uh, that sequence is that we experience in a really uh, vivid way her being uh, cast out, you know, like her having nothing in a way. And that then when she discovers this, uh, we found a way of making that feel like it, it's a partial answer. It kind of like, it kind of, that, that moment where she sees the happy birthday message right. from this long dead man to his son Isaac. The way she responds to that, that there's, she's kind of sensing some of this um, familial love that she wants so much. I just thought that turned out great because it, it paints the entire, the whole promise of the ancient world, again, with an emotional brush. There's something that she's going to find down here that's not just a matter of curiosity. It's a matter of, of, of emotion and what she needs. And then that kind of had ripples because the, the next quest where you play with Ross and he's teaching you things it became a lot more about the focus. And then they have that conflict about, um, you know, the uh, things of the metal world, things of the ancient world that's it's not okay to have. And she is like not going to let it go. And Ross, to his credit, realizes, yeah, I can't take that away from her. She doesn't have anything else. Right. They had that lovely power where it's almost like her playing with her iPhone and he's like, stop playing with that thing. I gotta yeah. show you how to hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Enough screen time. <laughs> exactly. David's responsibilities worked in two directions. First, he set up a pipeline to ensure that quest quality was always kept to a high standard. He created what he called an inverse pyramid where the main quests got the bulk of the attention, side quests a little bit less, and errands were given a lot less time and worked on relatively late in the process. The idea behind this was to avoid a scenario where the game world was crammed full of low stakes quests, a common issue in many open world games. But David was also responsible in helping the studio build the tools that would allow for quests to be designed. On Killzone, levels were linear and isolated from one another, but on Horizon, the team would require complex tools that would allow designers to develop quests with waypoints, dialogues, wind conditions, spawn triggers, effects, and so much more, all in a world that was constantly being iterated on by the level and world design teams. I interviewed in August um, and I was actually invited to come out for a couple of days in September so I officially started in early October but I came out for, for a short visit to meet with most of the engineering team with uh, Mikhail the tech director and, and a bunch of his leads where I kind of laid out my vision for how quest tools would work you know um, I'd seen a bunch of different ways of doing tools in other games ways things had gone poorly you know uh, common locations for for bugs or, or common missteps that I had seen up to that point. Um, so we talked about how we could kind of uh, encapsulate the scripting in, in layers that it made sense for it to be in and um, make sure that you're not duplicating a lot of uh, scripting in multiple places and just make it easier to, to untie and untangle what you're creating. Uh, but when, when I got here, the tools were, um, they were all focused around making kill zone levels. Everybody knew that the, um, that streaming would be a big one, uh, memory management, um, because like something like Killzone splices it into like a hundred different shards and you everybody plays the same game from A to B, basically, and maybe there's a couple of paths and twists and you can take a turn, but that's about it. So it's very predictable, you can test to see like does this part of the game fit in memory and does it load in time if you load the next part and there's like it's a, it's, it's, it's a, you can put it into an Excel table. And something like Horizon is like, you can go in any direction and just leave half a quest behind with all of those people with their plans and purpose because you just like engage with them. And we had no clue like what sort of effect that would have on memory. The tools originally were pretty good for creating bespoke things, but not for this, um, the, this, this broader implementation that we needed. Um, it was about a year and a half into development 
that the tools that we have now really started to come online. Yeah, that's um, actually something that came from JB, our art director. He was very clear from the start, like, you know, we have to do a lot of stuff with procedural placement because we cannot populate a very rich world or like do the sort of like artistic strokes of like on an iterate, we can't iterate on a world that big anymore. So um, he was very adamant as, um, as art directors can be on a uh, procedural approach and we made a placement system where the artists define rule sets and, and let them place like um, uh, meshes and stuff that they make but also sounds and entities. So they can for example say like okay if there is um, if the distance to the nearest river is within like eight meters um, and um, the height is uh, lower than uh, 200 meters or something, we spawn randomly these entities and you have like fire flies or something like buzzing bees around creeks. And it's like when the distance to a river is uh, zero meters, so basically you're in the river and the current depth is more than uh, two meters, we spawn um, I call it like all those stuff that you find in rivers, all those plants and everything. So like they all like automatically get that stuff inside. So this is our world data map. Right. Let's just zoom into where we are. So we have, we have a topo water. This tells us where the rivers are. Right. Uh, we have one for roads. And as you see, these have, they're not just black and white maps, they have a fall off on them. Mm. So I can tell it that the value here for, well, for example, in the river, the white part is where the water is, okay. and at 50% grey, that's the edge of the water. Right. And as it fades out, we can say, okay, this plant is next to the river, mm. so we're going to use a different tree here, oh, so because it, it knows that that area is next to the river. So that's all procedurally generated, because it's, it's nature, and there's no point in hand placing those things. It's not really, it doesn't add right. much, because it, that's just the way it works. Uh, but of course, like we don't procedurally generate you know, any, any, anything man-made. So right villages and settlements and everything that's all just like. What about uh, creature placement? That's all uh, hand placed. Hand placed as well, including animals? No, the wildlife is procedurally made. But it is again context dependent, so you'll find different types of, depending on the type of forest or the elevation or stuff, you'll find different uh, types of wildlife. We decided like that the, um, of course we were going to make an open world engine and everything's going to be like, you know, different streaming system and stuff and then they decided to put like things the size of entire kills on levels underneath in <laughs> underneath the ground uh, that took a long time to get right it was also it was I mean in retrospect it's funny because it's a good stress test for your engine uh, but yeah, you have the all the set of problems that we had in the first person game we also had um, but then in our uh, open world game underneath the ground and it had to seamlessly stream and they also made these ridiculous things where you have like a cauldron underneath the ground and then right on top of it there's like the hunters gathering or something and then like and we have to really have to it was really easy for the cauldron to be streamed in so you were standing there like you know talking with a campfire and a scene starts and then somebody disable some streaming triggers because you're in a, in a small conversation and all of a sudden you see everybody's face going to like five triangles and all the texture disappearing and you're like what the hell's happening it's like yeah it's starting to stream in a bunker that you happen to be standing right on top of <laughs> streaming the world was critical to ensuring the game had no loading screens and so didn't lose any of its immersive qualities but another important aspect of memory management is drawing what the engine spends time rendering for the player. Earlier this year, a Dutch documentary on the studio showed off its frustrum culling, much to the wonder of the game-playing public. I asked Mikiel to give us some insight into how that system works. Yeah, yeah first of all, like the whole frustrum culling thing, it was really funny to see that explode because I think it was a really good visualization of which is some of something that is like super normal in 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 the graphics industry. I mean. Um, of course, you don't draw stuff that's out of screen. Uh, this was not even about streaming, this was about drawing. Um, you basically, of course, like in, from a, you have a person somewhere in the world, if you're third person, you have a camera that's somewhere above probably, looking into the world, which is defined by something that ends up being square. So there's a point in space from which a sort of like square um, uh, thing called a frustum emits, and everything that's outside of the frustum you don't have to draw. And then even the stuff that's inside the frustum, um, you, what you try to do is like draw the things that are uh, cl quite close to you first and then the stuff that's behind it because you don't want to like draw a mountain and a bunch of trees on it and then you know five characters in front of it and then draw a house like you know one centimeter in front of you because you're wasting all the time first drawing a beautiful mountain while you're drawing like a door in, in front of it. So you try to first draw the door and then when you send the mountain to the GPU it goes like ah all those pixels are behind the door like toss it out. 
it happened to be in a documentary and people saw that and then people were like awesome they got it like you know that's what's really happening like yeah when that bunny hops off screen immediately it's, you know, it's not gone but of course we're not rendering it anymore the tools the team built were critical to the success of Horizon, but they worked so well that another team has now started using them, a team working on one of the most anticipated games in recent memory. When uh, Kojima-san was around, we did a bold move, and I think uh, JB, our art director, and myself made like a 340-page PowerPoint presentation with all the cool stuff that our engine did, and then at the end of it, we offered them a, a wooden box with a memory stick in it, and said, like, here, I have our engine source code. Um, they went through a very deep investigation that have later seen the results of a big Excel sheet, like hundreds and hundreds of lines of like investigation. It's like one of the most thorough and like battle-hardened teams you've ever seen. Um, and in, in the end, they were looking very specifically. I, I can't say too much, but like they knew which game they want to make. Hideo Kojima has a really good idea about what he wants. They were looking for something for the perfect fit, and one of the things that's really important to them is like making sure they get the best out of the platform to give the best experience for the people playing the game. They're really adamant. They want to make sure that they will do anything to make sure that the game is the best thing they can do on the platform that they're releasing it on. Um, so they were really impressed by uh, the performance figures, by uh, also the tool set around it. Um, and we've been working with them ever since. So, I mean, of course, they're taking it in a slightly different direction. They have a different game, a different focus on different aspects of the tools. A lot of stuff, I have a lot of experience in uh, a lot of different areas and they come up with questions and suggestions and, and they help us design better versions of our tools as well. I mean, it, it uh, definitely works both ways. It, it's actually really great to be able to help uh, Hideo uh, on Death Stranding. Uh, that is such an amazing team. Uh, they are so experienced and they're so talented. So it kind of was almost obvious that, hey, why don't we just offer what we have? how could that possibly hurt us and we'll, we'll help them out with that and they have been super grateful they've been bouncing some some really good feedback uh, so it's actually evolved into a collaboration it's really great as a developer just for the sake of making games if you can help a great team like that yeah i, I joked with uh, our tech director mckeel it's like uh, just as the 3d editor was starting to come online i was like you know the goal is you want to at the end be doing some sort of documentary where you're like look at our amazing tools and <laughs> and you know here we are today we spent four days at the studio talking to people working on the game and when we interview these developers we walk away with dozens of anecdotes about ideas they had that didn't make the final product so seeing as we're talking about a hideo kojima game right now perhaps this is a good moment to drop this one in so this was in the beginning when we started uh, our first prototyping, uh, just to get a feel for what the world would be and how hunting machines would work. We thought like, okay, if you, if you kill a big machine, what do you do with the components? Um, we, and we thought, okay, you, need, you can't just let the machine uh, be there on the ground. You need all the components. You want to salvage everything it has. But it was too much for Aloy to carry the entire machine, like a thunder jaw or something. So we thought, okay, maybe she can shoot flares, and when she shoot the flares up, uh, a flare up, then uh, a tribe that's nearby comes flying in with this giant flying wheel machine. Is what we created, um, like almost like a flying wheel pirate ship. Right. Yeah. Um, and they, with ropes, they climb down, they tie it to the machine, lift it, bring it to the city, and then you can collect your resources there. Or the guy from the ship drops some coins down, right. and you can catch it. Uh, but it was also complicated. We had this in a cinematic at some point, uh, but having to do this every time you kill a big machine uh, didn't make much sense. So we had a number of these kind of moments where things were just becoming too big and kind of almost ridiculous, and it also didn't look plausible right. as well. It sounds like a post-apocalyptic Fulton, like in Metal Gear Solid 5. It was that, yeah. <laughs> The various teams at Guerrilla were hard at work on their slices of the pie. Narrative was crafting believable characters and an emotive story. Quest design was making sure the missions in the game were diverse and engaging. Art was designing thousands of assets. Production was trying to ensure that everyone hit their milestones and that the game was coming together. Tech was trying to ensure that the whole game loaded in on time. But there's one critical piece we have to go back to. The idea that started this whole project off. The machines. The more military-style machines the team had originally envisaged are still in the game. They became part of the story as old-world weapons of war. But the animalistic machines we now know and love went through a dramatic evolution of their very own.
So the first machine that we ever finished was the Van der Joel. Everybody was sort of like, is this a good idea? This is, this is the most complex one. Uh, and then as our designer says, like, that's why we need to do it. Because basically, if we can make this one work, we can make the whole game work. And we started with that because it was, like you said, the most complex. Yeah. So we wanted to try out all the different things you could do with the machines, like taking the weapons off or slowing them down if you shoot at a certain part or freezing them or, or stuff like that. So we had all the kind of like basic uh, mechanical uh, capabilities of the machine already pres present on that. But after that first initial uh, design, it even became more complex because then that, that first simplistic one was just blocks. You couldn't shoot, for example, armor plates off. So there was an additional layer that we wanted. So that made it even more complex and more and more things. I think Beggy had something like 27 different weak points that all had different functionalities. So you would shoot this particular part and Beggy the robot needed to act in a different way. That particular part and it needed to act in a certain way. And everything also needed to stay visually read readable. A large point of our feedback is like, you know, sure you can add more and more different colors to these things, but ultimately a Christmas tree isn't really readable. I think originally like every resource canister had to be a unique resource. It was these kind of things like, yeah, but I cannot make that understandable or readable. Uh, so you know, we brought it down to like three, right. three or four. Uh, but we probably started out with like 12 different unique uh, uh, resources that you could shoot off the machines. So it's like, uh. At some point with the combat, we had um, so many hidden meters inside the machines. Um, and all the different machines had different meters and they had stamina and they had, uh, I don't know what, they, they got tired from running at some point and they, there were so many systems at play that we, we didn't know ourselves exactly how to fight these machines. Right. So that was kind of a moment where we said, okay, let's, let's dial it back and let's look at the bigger things. What is the most interesting and what is simpler for players to understand and what is fun to do? and that it's shooting things off machines, like shooting the plates and taking away armor. That's something players can intuitively understand and it's nice to break things. That's always nice feedback when you shoot something and something breaks off. Uh, so then we thought, okay, we have these, let's, let's put a bigger emphasis on the components. Let's do more with those. Which is also the reason why we basically picked the Thunderjaw as sort of like the prototype robot, just because we knew if we could hit all the things that would be fun on the robots on this one particular robot, we could just break it down and into smaller pieces and integrate those on the smaller type of robots like the watches and stuff like that. So um, that was more the exercise. Okay, well, what is like the total package, and then sort of like break it down into the smaller sections to the to the other robot. Uh, but it it took us 18 months to develop it at EV in 2015 when we announced it. This was also pretty much basically the only fully functional machine that we had. Uh, and even then, basically, it required a lot of scripting to keep this thing working. Uh, but sort of like it was this race towards okay, we're going to show the world basically that we have a game where you can robot, hunt robot dinosaurs. So make sure this works and this it works really well. All the design documentation of the robots were like 50 or 60 pages per robot wow. before, we, uh, before, we, before we eventually started making them. Because <laughs> everything had to be thought out first. Yeah. Describing everything from yeah, the attack ranges to the, what they would do idle and, and stealth and group behavior, yeah. uh, all the weak points, uh, where the armor would be, all those kind of things, hit reactions, uh, everything was defined. For example, with, um, with the Ravager, right? The Ravager was, I think, actually the one that we started the, like a full new production on after we did all the prototyping. Um, and then looking at it from a game design point of view and also from a visual point of view, that thing was just a predator, just like hunting its prey, right? So that's the one thing that I really wanted to emphasize in animation. And that's where also like the, as soon as we started to look for reference for like panthers, hyenas, etc., that are chasing their prey. There's all like, especially a, a cheetah, for example, like they're, they have such high speed that as soon as they sort of like try to change direction, there's all, all this sort of like, out of control motion on their legs, try to keeping up with the speed, and that's something that I really wanted to emphasize on the motion on those. To build a, a machine based on an animal with muscles again, you get all these nice like organic lines. You know, you get all these nice power lines and, and power curves and all these kind of things in it. And then we started building like the framework over it. And I started, instead of like doing the hexagonal, you know, machine stuff, we started like following the lines, and everything became nice and organic. And uh, on top of that, you put like the plating. Um, and of course they follow these lines as well and then you put in the detailing so 
instead of like this sort of super angular hard surface kind of machine, what, what, you know, from the inside out we actually build out this this new machine that has all these, you know, retain all these nice curves and became really, yeah, uh, uh, organic and, and actually became alive. One of the strongest aspects of the machine's design is their sound design. The machines in Horizon sound terrifically unique while giving the player critical audio cues for them to react to. As I discovered, much like the design and animations of these machines, a lot of the inspiration for the sounds came from animals. It's something that we wanted, like for the attacks have a very specific audio cue, so that even off screen you would know an, an attack would be coming next to the visual kind of uh, things that we do. And, and we wanted to have that character that we were describing also kind of represented in the audio. I think she also used like a chihuahua for the, for the scout in one of its tags. To have that kind of like uh, like jittery, yeah. uh, jittery dog kind of feeling. Uh, like the rah, 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 <laughs> when he comes at you. Okay, so the long legs I think had the chicken sound, but also, oh, I don't want to say this, but yeah, I'll say it, whatever. Uh, it was a lot of me, actually. Me All right. It, yeah. And me making a chicken? Yeah. People will hear it after this. I'm <laughs> ruining it. I hate this. <laughs> so actually, when, when I got robot designs, there wasn't any uh, instructions as to they're, they're going to have a vocalization. The term vocalization came purely from actually my idea that I need them um, to create a character. Uh, my goal was to have, especially for the machine types that are sort of in a group structure or in a herd, and if they are clearly exhibiting animalistic behaviors, I thought, okay, they would talk to each other, I guess. You can just observe them and have this chatter, chitter going on. Um, but they had to be balanced against the cues that you really needed to communicate. Say, when they see you first time, or when they get alerted to something, or uh, when they are in between, in a combat situation, occasionally they taunt you. And all these um, animations that actually are there, they, they are there for, to create their, cre sort of communicate their character, mm. but also a function. So to create this sort of iconic, re relatively easy to recognize kind of sound, mm. but still keep them attached to the size or the character of the robot. Our goal was that by not looking at the enemy, you could tell what it was doing and right. where it was. Um, by just by hearing. So you would hear if it was searching, if it found something, if it was going into combat, if it was about to attack. So all of these stages, all of these behaviors that are important for the player, we wanted the player to only uh, by audio to be able to, to, uh, to know what was going on. So that helps if once we got that uh, sort of working, that helped enormously with uh, some of these enemies that might not be in your view. You could still hear what they're doing. And I think players, maybe not consciously, uh, but I think they at some point will learn with specific sounds of machines uh, what's going on and if they need to run or dodge or uh, do something else. Yeah. Over the course of years, these machines evolved from concept drawings to prototypes to the machines we see today. They were iterated on, given new looks, personalities, new combat rules, audio cues, and so much more. They look and feel like real, believable, animalistic machines. And so perhaps the biggest testament to the quality of work that was done to animalize these robots was how that work impacted the wildlife in this game. Is there any AI or anything that's shared, or animations that's shared between the machines and the fauna, like just the animals? Yes, we, we did reuse some animations yes. for, for the fox, I think. I, I think basically all the, all the, like the wildlife, yeah. as we call it in the game, is basically a variant on one of the like machine animations yeah. that we did. Just, it was like one of the time constrained things, but in the end it actually worked out just because they're so animalistic, it basically actually transferred over to them. Really quick. And as soon as we had that, we just polished them up a little bit, of course, but um, yeah. a lot of sort of like the base animation for those wildlife things come actually become from the, from the yeah. machines. Um, yeah. They evolved into real creatures. Yes, exactly. Right. The game was chopped at and added to for years. It didn't originally have human-on-human -human combat, but through playtesting, they realized they needed some for variety and to help show the various types of tribal cultures. The tall necks, known internally as com giraffes, were originally huntable. You may remember them walking in herds in the original E3 2015 reveal. But some of the team didn't think murdering these elegant, non-aggressive creatures worked with Aloy's character. 
There was years of work done to create believable tribes with distinct beliefs, superstitions, and cultures. We're going to publish extended interviews containing a lot more of this deep, spoiler-rich insight at a later date. As the project barreled towards their 2017 release window, so much more had to be completed. A game at this scale requires so many elements working well and well together. The team all agreed that had it not been for these final months, Horizon Zero Dawn may not have come together at all. I think, it's, I think we were fortunate to have uh, this much time, uh, mostly. Uh, figuring out kind of lots of important things like Aloy, who is Aloy, what is her personality, what is her story, um, how old is she, what does she look like, all this stuff just took a lot of time to figure out. But also, yeah, the same thing is for the combat. Um, how, how does we, the unique component of this concept was of course these machines uh, in terms of gameplay and uh, but we didn't know how he would fight with these, uh, so it, looking at Horizon might feel like we already knew exactly that combat would be like this, because that's what it is, but that wasn't a, a straightforward thing that we just ended up there. Um, it was a lot of experimentation and cutting and adding and changing and simplifying in a lot of cases as well. A year and a half before we shipped is when we first saw, okay, this combat is going to be pretty cool. We were immensely fortunate. To, uh, to find Ashley Birch uh, to play Aloy. We actually had, uh, we heard a lot of auditions. We even had, uh, for some of the prototypes we did, we had sort of placeholder uh, dialogue that was put in place by uh, other actors. And none of that ever felt right. And the moment that we heard Ashley performing Aloy, is like, oh, there's Aloy. It was that feeling of discovery. I think I'm, I'm most proud on um how everybody worked together on it. Like if you, if the beautiful nature, uh, we, we got a lot of praise from our beautiful nature. It's, it's really so many different teams who had to collaborate on, on making that work. I mean, there's the huge, uh, let's say, performance side of things to, to get it to stream and, and, and to run a performance and the procedural content generation aspect of it. Uh, up till the, the sound team who, believe it or not, every, every ecotope, as we call them, have different bird sounds because they actually went to do the research and uh, and have that all work together. It's really hard to explain but if, if you look at the game three months before it was done it was nowhere near uh, the end result and then even when you think you know seven years that's such a long time how can three months more or less have? it doesn't really make the difference but it does it totally does. The technology enables uh, so you can do a lot more you can show a lot more detail uh, detail in everything in your assets in your in your animations uh, but also uh, the consumers, they expect a lot more scope, uh, gameplay duration. I'm actually really proud of the fact that we have um, been able to create a character that, that, um, that people embrace and want to follow. And, and I've gotten a lot of mail and, and, uh, from people who have daughters that um, you know, they go training like Alo did with Rost and they go practice and we're literally talking people with you know with daughters that are three four years old and they're on the couch and they're practicing and they're doing dodge rolls and they're <laughs> they're, they're, they're buying bow and arrow uh, so it seems that Aloy to many people was an important character and I don't think we've had a lead character before that um, that really inspired uh, so many people including young girls uh, that, that's just really wonderful that we have been able to create that. Do you have kids yourself? I have a 13-year-old son. Oh, I'm the lover. And um, he was not allowed to play the Frozen Wilds <laughs> yesterday. And he had not wanted to come in to the studio to play it because he wanted to play in one go. But he finishes his test today. Uh, and I think starting at three today, he will Excellent. be well into the Frozen Wilds. Do you make your 13-year-old son sign NDAs? Um, I'll let uh, Mr. <laughs> PR here answer that one. <laughs> It's the same thing I think happened with Killzone 2. It also, what we achieved there, it, it took a while before that actually sunk in and before I realized what we, what we built and uh, how, how much people were liking it. But it's, it's incredibly motivating, of course, to see this uh, response and gives a lot of energy uh, to start on a new uh, adventure. Are you sick of making open world games or? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no.
using some heat. Spare the weight. 